Gurur Brahma, Gurur Vishnu, Gurur Devo Maheshwaraha, Gurur Eva Param Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha, Chinmayam Vyapiat Sarvam, Trilokyam Sacharacharam, Tat Padam darshitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha vameva matha chapita vameva vameva bandhu sasakha vameva vameva vidya dvakam Swami the Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Swami the Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahabiryam Karababahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastuma Vidvishabahai Om Shanti 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 So Mark Herman, will you be our reader today? Uh, sure. So what verse are we on? We're on uh, chapter 13, number uh, verse number 14. Can we help us out? I therefore have neither unrestfulness nor a, a profound concentration. Both of them belong to the mind, which is subject to change. So, in the beginning, we are concerned with the restlessness of the mind. So, we have exercises in concentration to bring the mind to a single point. We bring the mind to a state of relative quiescence. So many people have the illusory notion that all thought will stop for an extended period of time. That can happen. But for most of us, if we have moments of real quiescence, we're doing well. The idea is to no longer believe the mind, to not take the mind seriously. What the verse is aiming at, though, is we want to get outside the mind. So I am no longer concerned about its being agitated or if it's in a state of quiescence. I'm no longer concerned with mind state. But this is a more advanced practice. Now, the seeker is seen to do spiritual practices so that he may purify the mind, realize his self. The man of wisdom may also be seen to be doing spiritual practices. This does not add to his knowledge of the self. You either see who you really are or you don't. So why would he do it? Because it's the highest form of worldly pleasure. Understanding. 
that the mind may go through all sorts of different changes. But the man of wisdom no longer has a concern for it. Just the mind. It's like listening to the traffic. Big truck goes by, no big deal. Motorcycle goes by, no big deal. Quiet car goes by, no big deal. I'm ever a part of that. Any thoughts on that? Next verse. How can I, who are pure and mindless, have those two. I am without any change and without a mind as I am all pervading and devoid of a body. Yes. So again, the mark of the man of wisdom is he identifies as consciousness, not as the equipment. I am not the body. I am not the prana. I am not the feelings, I am not the thoughts. None of those touch me. Now again, at one level, we're working with the mind by the mind. In the beginning, we're dealing with thought replacement. I want to replace my negative thinking with more positive thinking. But that's a preliminary practice. Then what we want to do is get out of the mind. Ultimately, the way to heal the mind is to get out of the mind. Give up my concern for this thought or that thought. Quit believing my mind. Where the mind itself sees its own fundamental unreality. I am not my mind. I'm not any thought of self. I'm not good. I'm not bad. I'm not smart. I'm not stupid. I'm not mentally ill. I'm not mentally healthy. What am I? I'm of the form of this consciousness. Shiva. Suspicious. Drop our identification with the body, mind, intellect. Drop our identification with the karta, the personal sense of self, the sense of doership. Over and over again. Go and go. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. So I who am ever free, ever pure, and ever awakened had duties to perform so long as there was ignorance. So understand that self-realization, enlightenment, is not about a bad person becoming something holy. It's not that my personality is going to transform into something fabulous. I realize that I was never bound in the first place. Just like if you have a nightmare and it's full of anxiety and stress, etc. When you wake up, you have not resolved the stresses of the dream. 
you go, oh my God, thank God that was just a dream. I'm okay. So also, at the moment of realization, we see not I was bound and now I free. I see, oh, I was never really bound in the first place. It was just a very long, a very vivid dream. What about my duties? What am I supposed to do in this world? Well, who's doing the stuff in this world? Very good question. So the man of wisdom looks at his equipment, the body, mind, and intellect, as fundamentally a dream-like appearance. It's going to do its thing in the world. But I no longer have concern for it. He acts his part in the world like an actor in a play. Giving up the idea that circumstances are what bring me peace. What brings me peace? Let go. It's all going to be okay because nothing touches the real self. So in a sense, the man of wisdom no longer has any duties to be performed. And yet the body appears to walk through its time in the world with its allotted dose of successes and failures, honors and dishonors, fulfilling the force of its past actions. Any thoughts on this? Giving up my ego is the hardest part. Uh, yeah. yeah, giving up my ego is the hardest part. Um, sometimes I feel like I just I'm here to learn and I want to learn more and everything is my teacher. Uh, but I don't know. Um, that's what I'm striving for. But who is it who's trying to learn? The ego. Yeah, and that's the issue. Right. Yeah. So. Our job as yogis is to give up the struggle of ego. Yeah. There, there's no end to what can be learned. It's like That's trying what makes to it come fun. to the highest number. Yeah. But I don't know. It seems, it seems to me what makes gives life purpose to me is that every time I get an answer, there's just another question. Yeah. So you can dance that dance at the level of the equipment, but don't take it seriously. Yeah, it's just another phenomenal activity. I like to learn stuff too. I like history like to learn about art, stuff like that, but it's, it's all just play. It's when we start to take it seriously. Oh, if I learn this lesson, it's going to make everything better. Now, if in the early stages of yoga, we are acting in a way that's contrary to the dharma, the path, the teaching. So, for example, Justin, if you were to go back and look at the yamas and the yamas in Raja Yoga, those 10 principles, 
it's a very good moral precept. It's a, it's a good way to, to get a guide for how to behave in the world or the stuff we've learned in program. But in the end, that only takes you so far. Any thoughts on that, Justin? Just that I got a ways to go. <laughs> but I, like you're saying, you, you, you liked my mantra that I come up with in the morning when I meditate. Who cares to every thought? And I try and empty my mind completely. Uh, and, because in the end, it's just between my ears that is the problem. And um, the, the, the challenge is not just to do it in meditation, but to do it when you're walking through life. Yes, and that's what meditation's been doing for me is making me reflect with everything. Uh, but excellent, excellent, good work. All right, next verse. How can I have concentration, non-concentration, or other actions in me, as all men feel that the acne of their lives is fulfilled when they meditate on me? and know me. Wonderful, he uses the word acme. We hardly ever get to see that word. The pinnacle of something. So again, what these verses are now working on is removing that last little piece, what we call the mumukshu, the one who's the seeker after liberation. Frequently, you will hear people say, well, it's not about arriving anywhere. It's the journey itself. Vedanta says, actually, that's not true. There is an end to the journey. So here the idea is, if you're meditating because you're trying to achieve some sort of wackadoodle mind state, that's not it. The man of wisdom has given up all struggle. And as I said a couple of verses back, the seeker meditates that he might get someplace, realize himself. But at the very end, we want to give up that striver, let it go. Now again, the man of wisdom may be seen to meditate. Merely because he enjoys it, like he may enjoy music or may enjoy a good meal. No attachment, no sense of striving. I have several students who regularly go do Vipassana retreats. And a couple of them are pretty well rooted in knowledge of the self. Come back after doing a 10 day retreat and I say, so do you know more self now? No, Jim, just more stuff came up, more emptying out, okay. What is the mark of the man of steady wisdom? The sthita pragna purusha. When he's cast off all the desires of the mind, satisfied in the self, by the self. No longer looks to the world. Get anything in the real or substantial. It's 
trinkets and baubles, colored glass, pratibinda, like reflections in a mirror. Mid, yeah, the loose ring. Next verse. I am therefore Rahman, the all comprehensive principle, ever pure, ever awakened, and ever unborn, devoid of old age, imperishable, and immortal. So do not strive to be an enlightened person. If you're identified with a personal sense of self, we're in a state of ignorance. Whether you think you're a miserable worm, whether you think you're a yogi working hard on yourself, or you think you're, I'm an enlightened person, all of those are states of ignorance. The man of wisdom knows, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am that ground of being. Chidakasha, the space of consciousness itself. Now, we talk about what is self-realization? Well, we actually have two ways of approaching it. There is a real knowledge. And when I say real, I mean with a capital R, which is the self-evidence of the self. You do not see, hear, taste, touch, or smell yourself. You don't feel yourself. You don't yourself. It is not known by any of the instruments of perception. Oh, is it unknown then? No. Do you exist? No. How do you know it? Well, I don't know. I just do. Yeah. You are the knower. You are the means of knowledge. You are that which is known never as an object, but as the subject, me. And again, the great cosmic joke is everybody already has it. We get nothing new. In the end, we see that's the only real knowledge. But, and it's a big but, where is the problem? The problem is in my stupid mind. It is the mind that suffers. Why does it suffer? The mind suffers because it attributes to the self the qualities of the not self, what we call adhyasa, superimposition. I think I'm my body, or I think in my body plus the personality. And as soon as I'm in that dreamlike state, it occurs like the dream world always the feeling of discontent. There's not enough. Then I start the whole rat race of samsara. More, better, different. I'll be happy when, it'll be better if, gimme, 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 gimme. And with that comes fear. I'm afraid I'm not gonna get what I want. I'm afraid I'm gonna lose what I have. 
I'm afraid I'm not okay. Anger. I'm not getting my needs met. All of that craziness is rooted in this false identification. What is my suffering? My suffering is the craving. It is karma. We just finished up the third chapter of Gita last Sunday. Arjuna asked Krishna, what is it that causes us to suffer? What is it that covers my apprehension of my essential nature. And Krishna says it is kama. Frequently translated as desire, but it's stronger than that. I like to use the word craving. Meaning it has this quality of insistence. I must have it this way. I must not have it that way. Rather than trying to resolve the struggle of ego, the yogi works on letting go of the attachment, letting go of the struggler itself. And I don't need to worry about my self identity, my self esteem, because I cannot be improved. I cannot be diminished. I am always the same. Yesterday, today. Don't believe me. In a quiet mind, turn the attentive faculty inward. Look. Inquire into your self nature. Now, very subtly, once the mind begins to realize, oh, my nature. Nityananda, eternal bliss. Sachidananda, existence, consciousness, bliss, absence. Then it begins to look at, well, the bondage wasn't real. I can let go of that stupid idea. And even this profound insight, this Pratyabhijnana, this recognition. That isn't ultimately real either. Only I is real. That point, the mind gives up belief in itself. The mind commits seppuku, psychic suicide. It quits growing up a belief in a personal sense of self. Even if out of habit it arises, oh, I see you for what you are. You're not real.
Any thoughts on this? Next verse. There is no knower other than myself among all the beings. I am the distributor of the result of their actions and the witness. It is I to whom all beings owe their consciousness without qualities and without a second, I am eternal. So the scriptures say, when you realize yourself, you realize the self and everybody else too. In fact, in all sentient beings. What do we mean by this? I'm aware of the room, the world from my viewpoint. You are aware of the world, wherever you are, from your viewpoint. They are different. I'm aware of my body. You are aware of your body. It seems like they are different. I'm aware of my emotions, my feelings. You are aware of your feelings, different. I'm aware of my thoughts, memories, beliefs, images. You are aware of yours. Different. But when I look behind my eyes and notice the knower, there's no thing. Just the vast, empty space, pure awareness. And when you look behind your eyes and notice the knower, there's just the space of pure awareness, vast and empty. The self in me is not like the self in me. The self in me is the self. Not just human beings, but the dogs and the frogs and the worms and the germs. It's the ground of being of everything. Now, here he talks about the giver of the fruits of action, of everything that happens. Even though consciousness is one without a second and absolutely still, immovable, a homogeneous mass of pure awareness, vijnana gana, as Mandukya said. co-eternal with the self is maya, maya shakti. Maya is such a groovy word. One etymology is ma, which means not. So it means that which is comprised of what is not. A big lump of nothing. Called illusion. We talk about it being the creative power of the infinite, but nothing is really created. It's just imagined. And the locus of Maya is consciousness itself, it's its nature. Out of it, all of this proceeds. So just because you or I get realized doesn't mean the universe goes away. The infinite continues with its maya shakti, its power, its of illusion. Now, this universe is a 
cosmos, not a chaos. Yesterday, light traveled at 186,000 miles per second. When I woke up this morning, it was the same. Gravity is still gravity. Two plus two still equals four, not five or eight. It is governed by law. There are physical laws. There are metaphysical laws. And the great rishis, the seers, that means all of us, if we get quiet enough, begin to perceive what Carl Jung called synchronicity. That this manifestation is interconnected, it's organized, it's intelligent. And life becomes a whole lot easier if we surrender to. I can't, he can, I think I'll let him. This illusion of the ego that I of myself have to make stuff happen. Part of what makes us suffer. It's all gonna work. So let the body, mind, intellect do its work in the world. Why is it going to do what it does? The course of the past maturing as it interacts with the society. Will you win the lottery or will you lose money in your 401k? All the force of the past maturing. But the yogi understands that his well being and his happiness is not dependent on external circumstances. Just like if you go to the movies and you see a romantic comedy and you laugh through the whole thing, when you walk out of the theater, it was just a movie. You go see an action flick and there's car crashes and gunfights. You walk out, it's just a movie. You go see a horror film and there's blood and guts everywhere. You walk out, it's just a movie. Meaning, it never really touches you. This is no different. interesting part is it's always a surprise film you may think your life is a romantic comedy but it may turn out to be an action flick and the story is fundamentally the same Body's born into this world, you grow up, you grow old, you get sick, and you die. But something there is that's never touched. There are several of us in this class who are old men. 
but if you sit in a chair and you're still so nothing hurts, you don't feel any different than you did when you were young. Because the self is ageless. Even death does not touch that. Ah. All right, next verse. I am not the three visible elements, nor the two invisible ones. Neither am I both, their combination, the body. I am devoid of all attributes and the three gunas. In me, there is neither night nor day, nor their juncture. I am always of the nature of light. So I'm not sure what he's referring to. Is there a little commentary in it, Mark? The three visible elements are uh, earth, water, and fire, and the invisible ones are air and ether. Okay. So again, the ancients thought that these tanmatras, these elements, formed the subtle world and then divided and recombined to form the physical world. The point that he's getting at here is all of that is not so. So read, read the verse again now so I understand it better. I am not the three visible elements, nor the two invisible ones, neither am I both, their combination, the body. I am devoid of all attributes and the three gunas. In me, there is neither night nor day, nor their juncture. I am always of the nature of light. Yes. So. I'm not anything that comprises the physical or subtle world. So the gunas here, meaning the qualities of mind. I am not a mind state. I'm ever the knower of all mind states. And when he says here, I am ever the nature of light, the kasha. The sun, for example, is that light by which we see everything in the waking state during the day. But I don't need to get a flashlight in order to illumine the sun. And when the earth rotates and it's nighttime, rotation of the earth does not affect the sun. The sun is always shining. Likewise, I am the illuminator. In the waking state, the self is experienced as the witness of all objective phenomena the witness of the body, the witness of all mind states. Even the witness of deep sleep. You are not unconscious in deep sleep. You are seeing the mind folded up into darkness. It is like when you close your eyes. When you close your eyes, you're not blind. You are seeing the back of your eyelids, which obscure everything else. You are beyond every phenomenon. Always shining. It is because of the self, me, 
I know the past, I know the present, I will know the future. If someone looks through the James Webb telescope, looks back 13.5 billion years to see baby galaxies on the other side of the universe, just fantastic what they're looking at. Someone is the knower. All knowledge is dependent on the knower. And in those moments when we stop the mind, find those, maybe it's just little flashes of space between the thoughts. Even when there is nothing to be known, I still shine. Next verse. Just as the ether is subtle, without a second, and devoid of all forms, so I am the non-dual Brahman, devoid even of the ether. So the word here is akasha, and it's frequently translated as ether. It actually means space. And many of the ancients thought there was something substantial in space. Then we went through a period in physics where we think, no, space is just empty. And now even more modern physics, as we start talking about dark matter and dark energy, maybe there's stuff in space after all. But the whole point here is that space is independent of the objects in it. For example, here is the coffee mug. There is space inside the coffee mug, space outside the coffee mug. If I move the mug, I don't have to pick up space and put it back in. Nothing happens to the space. And when the cup is broken, Nothing happens to the space. So also, the body, mind, intellect, and that personal sense of self are temporary, finite, and mutable. But the knower of them all is eternally here. Don't believe me. Throughout your day, whether it be a good day or a bad day, successful or failure, anytime you thin out the mind and look within, check out yourself. Oh, Jim. Yesterday I was the space of consciousness, but today I'm a pink blob. No. They're always the same. Don't believe me. Keep looking. Understanding that if it has qualities and characteristics, if it has form, shape, most importantly, if it can be objectively known, an object of consciousness, that isn't it. Any thoughts? Next verse. The distinction between the self in itself and myself is due to the superimposition of different adjuncts on one and the same self. 
just as the difference is wrongly conceived to exist in one and the same ether owing to apertures in the various objects. Your voice cut out a minute. Would you read it one more time, please? No, I'm sorry. The distinction between the self in itself and myself is due to the superimposition of different adjuncts on one and the same self, just as the difference is wrongly conceived to exist in one and the same ether owing to apertures in various objects. So the imagery that Shankar is using, I can have mug space, I can have bowl space, I can have uh, uh, glass space. And what I'm defining is actually the nature of the aperture, not space itself. If I had a water glass and the coffee mug, here's where there's coffee mug space, here's water glass space. Did I move space? Did space change in any way? No. I call it cup space. What I'm really doing is describing the aperture, the container. Yes, we can say there's space inside the mug, but actually the mug is in space. So also, what is the difference between Paramatman, Supreme Self, and Jivatman, the individual self, or is there a difference? Because I attribute to the self the qualities of the not self, it seems like. I am inside my body. But actually, all that is in me. Best way to approach this is again to go to the dream state. Do you incarnate into the dream? Well, it sure feels like it. It feels like I'm in the dream, I'm the dream body, I have a dream identity, and I'm dealing with a dream world, and I have dream thoughts and feelings inside. But upon awakening, I see, no, that was just the shattering, the refracting of the mind into those elements. I was never in the dream. The dream was in me. And in fact, it wasn't even really in me. It was just imagination. Vivid. It seemed real. But it's not real. So here Shankar is saying this distinction between the individual self, Jivatman, and the Supreme Self, Paramatman. Well, actually, is there a distinction between cup space and room space? Not really. It's all just space. Likewise, it's all just consciousness. Just as when the cup is broken, nothing happens to space. Whatever happens to the body, mind, intellect, and the ego sense never touches me. What is my problem? I attribute to the self qualities of the arms. Any thoughts? Next verse. 
how can difference, absence of difference, oneness, manyness, and the qualities of being known and being a knower, the results of actions and also agency and experiencing be attributed to me, who am one only. Yes. So all these things I seem to think belong to me. I have parts, gross and subtle. I do this, I don't do that. I have this mind state, I have that mind state. This action that's good, another action that's bad. All of those simply are descriptions, evaluations, the activity of this dream-like pratibimba, this reflected self. I have a relationless relationship with it. None of it could exist without a life principle that I am. Yet none of it really touches me. It just seems to long and vivid. How many more verses in this section, Mark? Four. Okay, I think we can end it. Keep going. I have nothing to reject or accept in as much as I am changeless, always free, pure, awakened, and without qualities. I am without a second. So again, it depends on where we are in our sadhana. If we have some very definite character defects that cause harm to others, to ourselves, we work on that. We reject those bad behaviors, we work on accepting Thing, good behaviors. But there's no end to that process. At some point, Shankara says, let go. Get out. So one of the things you see in the mind of the man of steady wisdom is there's no longer the need to be right, to be defensive, to protect ego, to feel important. All of those drives are rooted in being identified with a personal sense of self. Paradoxically, one of the first real proofs that we're letting go of our identification with ego is we can admit we're wrong, or even when we're not wrong, we don't need to be fed. It's all just mine. Let it go.
Now, in the end, even the philosophical system of Vedanta is just a collection of ideas. It's very powerful. It's like a thorn used to remove a splinter from our finger. In the end, they both get thrown away. But Vedanta isn't real. Only I is real. Now let go of that thought as well. So the yogi has no need to argue philosophy with anybody. There are no true ideas. Including the one I just uttered. Next verse. One should, with great concentration of mind, always know the self to be all. One certainly becomes all-knowing and free when one knows me to be residing in one's own body. So, here Shankara is moving towards the end of this section. This is Jnana Abhyasa. It's a practice. Whenever the personal sense of self arises, we use the mind to get out of the mind. I see you for what you are, you're not real. Whenever craving arises, I must have this, I shall not have that. I see you for what you are. over again, attachment by attachment, identification by identification. This is, for want of a better term, the manual labor of yoga. There's nothing magical. There's no magic wand the guru's going to go a wanga and it's all fixed. We must do the work. Next verse. He who thus knows the reality of the self becomes successful in attaining the goal of his life and becomes perfect. He becomes a knower of Brahman and one with it. One knowing the self otherwise may be said to commit suicide. Yes. So a person who attains a human birth, meaning I'm asking the right questions, is exposed to a valid means of knowledge, understands that the goal of life is moksha liberation and yet continues to wander in a world of achieving and getting and acquiring and suffering. It's just like, for example, in the 12 step programs, we say there is no more painful state than a head full of AA and a belly full of booze. You could no longer fool yourself into thinking, well, if you had my problems, you'd drink too. So also, the yogi sees, okay, force of my past is so strong and I'm still doing stupid things, but at least don't embrace a rotting corpse thinking it's a beautiful body. At least have enough self-honesty to know that 
cause of my sufferings, I mean to be stupid. Let it go. One more, Mark, or two more? This is the last one. Okay. This ascertained meaning of the Vedas, described briefly by me, should be imparted to those who have given up worldly action and controlled their minds by one whose intellect has been trained, according to the scriptures, under a teacher who has known Brahman. So he sums it all up. First, we engage in these preparatory practices of service, devotion to the teacher, study of the scripture, thought replacement, giving up our attachment to worldly things, developing a meditation practice. Then we engage in these deeper exercises in contemplation. When it says we attain Brahman, we achieve Brahman, well, language falls short. We realize we've always been it. All right. So we are, what chapter for next time? 14? That's correct. All right, we'll end here today. Om pur namada pur namidam pur nat pur namudachate pur nasya pur namadaya pur nameva vishishate Om shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om